Yes, thank you, Lavinio. I'm uh, going to be brief, um, and I basically take this chance just to um, talk a little about uh, a little bit about um, a project that we are currently implementing. And I want to say that this is not a shameless plugin. Uh, it has to do with the health sector, and uh, it also has to do with money uh, that we bring. Uh, uh, to those companies who are interested in innovating uh, in the health sector. So the project is called Desire, you can see the name there. Uh, it's a Euro cluster project, it's a partnership between five uh, organizations from across Europe, two from uh, Austria, uh, one from France, one from Poland, and obviously uh, Cluj IT. And, um, the idea is very simple. We know that there are many challenges across the uh, health sector, and um, the European Commission um, came with this program called Eurocluster, where they encourage uh, clusters from across Europe to tackle these issues, these challenges. And the health sector has many challenges, and um, we are, as I said, part of this uh, consortium. Uh, the main idea behind the project is to um, uh, leverage on some of the knowledge that the clusters have. Uh, these are not all IT clusters. Actually, there are two IT clusters. The other uh, three which are present in the consortium are from the health sector and from the internationalization uh, area. So the idea is to bring this uh, uh, knowledge uh, together then the second idea is to uh, create a community, a European community around, around the uh, healthcare sector. And the third idea, and very important, is to uh, provide some financial means, as I said, to innovative companies who uh, are proposing solutions for the health sector. And um, I just want to let you know, and maybe you can spread the word, that uh, starting September we will launch a call um, where we will be able to finance uh, healthcare companies. It's a seed funding, if you want, uh, 30,000 euros that we will put out for each company who applies. So there is a process, obviously, that needs to be followed. But there is a prize at the end of 30,000 euros uh, to uh, implement or to take further, make another step towards the uh, uh, solution that uh, the company is proposing for the health sector. Uh, that's one v value. The second value is um, that you as a company, or I mean your, from your network, uh, will be able to become part of a European community, as I said. And we built a platform, which is called the Desire Platform, so the name of the project, so it's fairly uh, easy to remember. You can uh, look it up and um, you can register on the platform. Uh, we already have approximately, I don't know, uh, I think uh, 150 members of that, on that community. These are stakeholders from across Europe, from the health, sec health and technological sector. There are uh, companies, there are uh, clinics, there are uh, also uh, large bodies, including uh, uh, research uh, un uh, universities, research institutes. So it's an eclectic mix of uh, stakeholders, which in one way or another have something to do with the health sector. And uh, we hope that slowly, slowly we will grow this community. The project is uh, ending in two years from, two and a half years from uh, now on. By the end, we really hope to have a, a representative community at the European level. So that's it from my side. It's an invitation to follow this project, to follow what we propose for the community and take advantage of the uh, uh, things that we are able to bring through the desired project. Okay. Thank you, Andre. Uh, our next guest is uh, Professor uh, Andreas. Uh, I will let him introduce himself uh, and uh, he will uh, give us a talk about uh, using algorithms in drug discovery and how they can be translated into startups. Oh, great. Looking forward to hear uh, your presentation. Thank <coughs> Yeah, sounds good. Thanks for the introduction and for welcoming me uh, to speak here. So I have quite a diverse background. I 
did chemistry, biology, computer science, worked in pharma companies, Novartis and AstraZeneca. We also set up three companies. Uh, and so my wife is actually Romanian. That's one connection here. But there's also a scientific and technical angle uh, that connects me to Cluj. And I will go through that in the next couple of slides. Um, so it will be about life science, AI, startups, um, because that's always the uh, interface I interacted with. Um, <coughs> and I will summarize where we stand, uh, very briefly talk about the science, because that's the background for uh, what we established as well as current opportunities. Um, so as I said, so I'm actually still in Cambridge um, right now, so I work for university. We started a couple of companies, and I will share my findings, basically my learnings uh, from that experience. Um, so any statements I make, because I work with companies as, uh, as well, are in my capacity as an academic, so there's no company message as such in here, but some learnings from working with companies. Um, and if you're interested in AI, drug discovery, how can data actually be used for drug discovery, I can really recommend those two articles. They are open access um, and generally understandable for scientists, um, uh, so feel free to give those a look. Um, they're accessible at that particular website here. Um, <clears throat> so what, what I will go through, and drug discovery, very brief review, uh, where do things stand, just as an opener, um, some pieces of science uh, that you can use to build opportunities in companies. I'll share three stories, so the three companies I was uh, involved in starting, uh, what did I learn from that, how did it work in different environments, uh, in Cambridge, in Berlin, and so on, um, and I'll very briefly uh, illustrate my link to Cluj and Romania as well. Um, so where are we actually right now? Um, AI and drug discovery. And the older you get, the more you notice that uh, life comes and goes in waves, right? Uh, certain topics come up, uh, then they go back again, then they come up again, and so on. Um, so this is a fortune cover from 1981, uh, so 40 years ago. Proclaims the next industrial revolution, right? Uh, structural biology came up, docking, so you can fit a ligand to a protein, computational drug design, basically. That was 40 years ago, proclaiming the next industrial revolution. If you look at that headline uh, or cover page, that looks pretty similar to current headlines, right? How AI is changing drug discovery. There's 40 years in between. Things are different. We have much more data. We have GPUs, algorithms, ontologies, and so on. And many things did change, um, but things come and go in waves, right? And usually you have some type of hype, certainly, and then you have disappointment. But certain uh, good methods and so on, they do prevail, right? And something is better than before. Uh, but my point is, uh, not everything prevails uh, either. But companies clean up data. Yeah, that's one of the consequences of the last 15 years or so, annotating data, having the right life science data in place. We had that before in some contributions, yeah? AI and algorithms, in many areas, it's a commodity, right? But the question is, what's the question, the business question, and the data you put in? And that is actually very important. Um, there was quite a lot of funding going into the area, uh, maybe 16 billion or so until uh, two years ago. Uh, things crashed last year. It's very difficult to get venture capital right now, of course. But the point is there was quite a lot of capital going into AI and drug discovery. But that's only input, right? I mean, you have resources, input, then you need to do something and then you need to produce output. And those things are quite often a bit disconnected. And not everything translates into practice, yeah, into real world impact, right? Um, and what do you see here? That's a recent review from Nature Review Drug Discovery, re review article uh, journal in our area. Um, and on the left-hand side, you have AI native companies. On the right-hand side, top 20 pharma and the drug discovery projects they work on. And projects, they're first preclinical in the Petri dish, if you want, then they go into animals, then into patients. So the projects move from green to blue, if you want. And on the left-hand side, you have AI native companies, and you see lots of green. So very many early stage projects, and they didn't really move into patients, and they were not successful in patients, okay? And that's exactly that translation that I mean from uh, good ideas and lots of capital uh, to practical impact. Looks different in pharma companies, right? You have much more blue clinical projects, basically, right? Um, so you need to make sure if you have a tech idea, right, uh, match that with the right uh, business opportunity, the right question, and the right data yeah, in order to match data and algorithms to answer that question better uh, than you could do it before. Doesn't always happen, right? And so AI and drug discovery is still finding its way basically of that practical, uh, to, to that practical and clinical impact. There's some projects, of course, and uh, I really hope that approaches succeed, but the question is which data and algorithms do I need to address which question? And that's not a natural match in many areas. Um, so what's the conclusion? There's lots of activity in early stage pipelines, but translation to the clinic, that still needs to happen. Um, but there's also some meta-level learnings. Uh, so everything comes and goes in wave in life, right? Um, computers and drug discovery, for example. Data defines where to go with AI in a particular field, right? You match a question with data and the algorithm, and then you can have impact. Um, short term, uh, you can only measure input. 
how much funding did you get, for example? But in medium term and long term, what matters is output, right? What did you achieve? Uh, it's the same if you learn skills, of course, right? Uh, in the beginning, you can measure, uh, did I practice my words or sports half an hour a week or so? But after three years, of course, then the question is, what did I learn, right? So short term, you measure input. Longer term, you can measure output. Um, areas behave very differently. <coughs> and this is what this slide is meant to illustrate. Um, in image recognition uh, and speech recognition, there's great progress, right? Using uh, uh, deep neural networks, CNNs, RNNs, and so on. Um, and but areas are different. Data is different. Questions are different in very different areas. And that's from the Struck Discovery Today article, which I mentioned before. <coughs> um, what you see in the top is an image. And using convolutional neural networks applied to images. And what you see is a cat. And you can represent that image as a matrix, right? Every pixel has a certain uh, color, so a certain pattern of bits set, basically, that uh, describes the color in that pixel. Um, so the matrix is a very good representation of the object. You can have a convolutional network right, that detects edges and so on uh, in that particular image. And then you can label your object very well. You can say there's a cat in the picture, there's no cat in the picture. Of course, objects, objects can be partially hidden and so on. Not everything is easy. But by and large, there's a very smooth integration. right? You have an object, an image, pixel representation is good. Convolutional network can operate on that representation and you can label your data. It's very different in drug discovery. Yeah? In biology, quite often, you don't know how to profile patients. Is it genomics? Is it proteomics? Um, which particular types of cells is it? If you have a disease, is it early stage or late stage? And so on. Yeah? So that's very difficult to do. So you basically don't really know what to focus on. You don't have that matrix representation that tells you in an image where you are and how to encode your features. Okay. Um, and then you don't know which uh, machine learning method to use intrinsically, and you cannot label your data. So what's the point of all of that? If you have progress in one area using machine learning methods on image recognition, that may translate to histopathology, so where you slice organs. You can also recognize images, right? It may translate to that, but maybe not to other areas of drug discovery that behave differently, because your data is different and the question you ask is very different. Okay, so you always need to see what's your question, what's the data, how do you translate uh, to practical impact. Um, there's also one disconnect between uh, computer science, AI, uh, and the field uh, that you apply that model in. And that's illustrated here. Uh, it's illustrated in the drug discovery area, um, but it applies to any other area. The question is always model versus process. Okay, there's a model you can train. You may have very good performance, but the question is how do you translate that into real world impact? So this is what a, a machine learning person would be happy with. Uh, you have data, you put that into a model, you have a very good uh, accuracy or recall, precision, whatever you want to measure. Then you publish that paper and you're happy. Okay, you're done. But that's not how real world impact works, right? Um, in the real world, so this is an example from drug discovery, yeah? you have a project context. Uh, so you work in a lifestyle disease, um, let's say Viagra or so, or you work in terminal cancer. Right? And that context is very different. Uh, it determines uh, which side effects of a medication you would tolerate, for example. Okay, That's the project context. And the other question is, uh, if your model predicts something, it predicts a compound is toxic, for example, what do you do in a pharma company? You invested 20 million in that project. The computational model tells you you're 63% certain uh, that your compound is toxic. Do you throw everything away because the computer says that the compound is toxic? Probably not, right? So you need to have an, an essay, so a test system, an experiment in place uh, to support that decision, right? If you don't have that in place, the prediction is worthless, okay? So you have a project embedding and then you have a follow-up of any prediction, right? And you need that uh, in a real-world context in order to translate model predictions in order to uh, process improvements, right? Um, the model is embedded in a process. That's very important as well. And there's often, uh, in particular in the life sciences, also in drug discovery, uh, there's a disconnect between the two, right? But you need to bridge that. So if you build a model, any machine learning model, always embed that into a context. What's the use case, right? How do you measure success? What's the follow-up? And so on. Okay. Um, so that was the context. So where can we use, uh, actually, algorithms in drug discovery? Uh, for example, in targeted medicine. If you look into cancer medications, you go into clinical stages. Uh, if you have a companion diagnostic, it's called, that tells you which type of patient you have, you go from 3% to 8% clinical success rates, right? Patient stratification, telling, understanding disease better, right? That has big impact. 
Uh, computers can also generate molecules right now and evaluate them on the fly. Uh, any big pharma company does that right now. So you can evaluate and generate novel structures and they tell you uh, that compound is likely to be active, that compound is likely to be toxic. So you can do those um, DMTA cycles as they are called, design, make, uh, test, analyze cycles. Uh, you can run them in the computer. Um, so that was kind of the opener, right? Um, so what matters? Well, the question matters, do you have the right data? What's the embedding of a particular computational model in a particular process? Um, I, I want to give an example as well. How can we actually use data to build a company? And that's what we did here in this particular case. <coughs> so uh, 10 years ago or so, we started using gene expression data to characterize disease and to map that to particular uh, drug treatments. Gene expression, so you have cells in your body, uh, 23,000 genes or so, and some of them are upregulated, so you have more of that gene, others are downregulated. And that particular pattern determines which cell you have, so you have different cells in the brain or in other parts of your body. Um, and also if you have a disease, a cancer for example, some genes can be upregulated and downregulated. And we can use those patterns to match a disease to a drug. That's the whole principle uh, that is described on this slide. And we can use that principle for cancer, we can use it in many other areas. We can also use it for regenerative uh, medicine. Uh, why is that important? We all get older, at some stage we don't produce insulin anymore, uh, maybe there's particular parts in the eye, uh, the macula for example, that degenerate, um, but if we can induce stem cells to rejuvenate themselves, to produce new cells, uh, then we can actually regenerate that part of the body. And that's what we did in this particular case here. So we used gene expression to pick drugs to rejuvenate, if you wish, parts of our body. In this particular case, case we wanted to generate uh, cardiomyocytes, heart cells basically that make your heart beat. Um, and so the computer told us which compound should we put on a stem cell to uh, differentiate stem cells, so undifferentiated cells, uh, to cardiomyocytes. And so after three weeks, uh, we were looking at the microscope and you really see uh, that the cells are beating. Uh, and that's the closest I got to being God, probably, uh, that you, the computer tells you which compound to choose in order to generate those beating uh, cardiomyocytes. Uh, and that's fascinating. I find that really fascinating. Um, why is that important in practice? Well, because we can use that principle to start companies as well. Uh, for drug repurposing, for example, uh, drug combination therapy. Um, so that's what we did with uh, Helix. So I was uh, CTO in the beginning of that company. That's now 120 people. It's based in Berlin. Um, and so that uses data uh, for drug repurposing in rare diseases. Um, and so that uses different types of data, can be gene expression data, can be text data as well, combined with NLP and so on. And there's now the first compounds uh, going into clinical trials as well. Um, some learnings. Uh, so we started three companies. One was uh, Helix, that was uh, in Cambridge 2014. Uh, very different times from today. That's about 120 people now. Uh, there's Farminable also in Cambridge in the UK. Um, there was actually another funding round announced just uh, a week ago or so uh, of 8 million. So that's about uh, 20 people right now. Um, these companies were started in the UK. And Terra Lumina, that's a company uh, we were starting to start uh, in Berlin. I just want to share some, some learnings from those different companies. Um, so Helix was started in the uh, when I was working in the chemistry department uh, in Cambridge. Um, and so was uh, Tim, so he's uh, CEO of Helix. Um, so he came to my office one day, uh, 2013, I think, uh, and he told me, hey, Andreas, uh, let's use data for drug repurposing and so on. Because that was an area I was working on as an academic, right? So what does that tell us? Uh, there's really benefit of the environment, right? Uh, having science into one place, you can go to someone next door and say, hey, that's cool, let's try to do something together, right? So that's beneficial. Um, also, the original founding team, everyone was local. Tim Gilliams, David Brown was at Pfizer before. He was one of the uh, inventors of Viagra. Uh, David Kavala, he's a repurposing expert, so exactly the area the company operates in, as well as myself. Um, then was Amadeus next door, uh, so basically a VC company that gave us money in the beginning. Um, and my PhD students were also working uh, with Helix then, uh, so there was basically scientific expertise that could uh, support those companies. So two learnings here. One is uh, the speed of change varies a lot between fields. I remember in 2014 when we started Helix, it fell late to start an AI company in the life science area. It's ridiculous if you think about it right now, but that's how it felt like because there was big data since 2011 or so, AI was two years old and I thought, oh, the field is already two years old, it's too late. Well, it was not, of course. Uh, learning two was uh, building a company that's not only tech uh, is safer. 
uh, because otherwise Google comes in, copies everything, and you're done more or less. Um, but Helix was also working with patient groups, for example, uh, patient charities, where you build a relationship with people. Okay, that's uh, something a tech company cannot just only copy. Um, so if you have a second leg uh, to stand on, basically, uh, that can make it much safer. Um, second story is Farmenable. Uh, so that was a company uh, that was co-founded with another uh, chemistry professor when I was there. So again, the environment uh, mattered quite a lot. Another part was uh, the CEO of the company was allowed to start the company part-time besides her university job. Yeah, so the university basically um, took their hands off and gave freedom to people inside the uh, university to actually uh, go for their own endeavors as well. Um, and that freedom uh, isn't always there uh, in academia. The platform was validated together with pharma companies, uh, so the Taurus was next door. Okay, so you also have biotech companies nearby that can be mutually beneficial. Um, and yeah, the tech transfer office doesn't get in the way in the sense of it's good for the ecosystem, uh, right, if you have successful companies. And so you can involve the tech transfer office. You should if it's a university-based invention, right? Uh, but if there are startups that are started outside the company, that's also allowed. Yeah? So basically whatever works yeah, to make your company successful, that flexibility was there as well. Um, the environment matters, and uh, the other learning is bootstrapping is very difficult in that space. If you do life sciences, you need lots of capital for validation and so on. Uh, so after a while, then funding was brought in. Yeah, that was the other learning. Um, third story was Tara Lumina. So that was a, a company we wanted to start in Berlin. That was based in an AI incubator. So that's a tech tech background, not biotech tech tech. Um, and so recruitment Berlin worked very well, actually. Incubators can be useful, of course, um, because you gain expertise very quickly, uh, you get connections and so on. Um, the landscape looked very different. Cambridge is very small, everyone knows everyone, and Berlin is much bigger. Um, so eventually we decided not to proceed with the company because of the funding parameters. Um, you buy that particular incubator, we could get money as well. Um, so the important thing is really look for the right partner for your particular idea. For tech tech, uh, I think it's the right place. For biotech, uh, where timelines are different, uh, it wasn't the right place. And so tech tech is very different from biotech. And there's also the usual, how do you validate your platform question? Yeah? Is it a tech validation or is it asset development? Yeah, And biotech is usually asset development. So that's very different. So you have to look for the right partner as usual in life, I guess. Um, so that's my second learning uh, from that story. Um, so this is, I think, what matters. Here it's displayed linearly from bottom to the top, but of course it's a feedback loop, right? Um, so you have some uh, generators of ideas, can be universities, can be previous founders, can be big pharma as well, because we work quite a lot with uh, big pharma, and then you see uh, what's actually not working, right? And if you see what's not working at AstraZeneca, then you can see uh, maybe I should do that, right, in my own company. Um, and so that interaction can be very useful, also then for the big pharma company, of course. Um, and so, so you have something, you generate an idea from uh, one of the different places. Um, and then you have enablers, right? So you need money, you need good people, and so on. And then you can build your uh, platform and your assets based on that. And that's a feedback loop, right? Uh, in Cambridge, I think the first uh, uh, biotech park was started in the 60s or so by Trinity College, right? And that's now a self-feeding uh, loop, basically, right? But these are some of the uh, parts that would matter in that context. Um, some other examples, pathways of innovation, right? How those links in the local ecosystem could work. Um, AstraZeneca moved to Cambridge, they found a student in my lab, and the student then started her own company, for example, yeah? Uh, funded by local angels. So you see all the links, right? AstraZeneca, the student, um, then he goes out and so on. Um, a tech company gets sold, uh, then the founder uh, provides private equity and supports the whole life sciences ecosystem. And um, that's, for example, Amadeus and Hermann Hauser. I mean, that's the background, more or less. Or uh, sequencing, so Lexa sequencing, uh, so genome sequencing, uh, also comes from the chemistry department in Cambridge. Um, so there was two academics together, okay? Very different expertise, biological as well as imaging. Um, and they basically um, started that company, and then the company gets sold for a lot of money. Um, and that is also, it, that interface between academia uh, as well as uh, companies, right? Uh, th that is very strong, both in my opinion, really. Um, uh, it's mutual fruition uh, that you can achieve that. Um, what's the Cambridge approach to just about everything? So in some senses, that, uh, that's the whole uh, secret. Recruit the right people and let them do what they want. But there's a, there's a big question in there, recruit the right people, okay? So you need to pay quite a lot of care. Who is the person you recruit? But then the right people want to do the right thing, yeah? And if you're right 90% of the time recruiting the right people, they do the right thing, yeah? Uh, work together, do something good. Can be science, can be education, can be starting companies, can be anything. Not everyone needs to start a company in Cambridge either, right? But you can if you want. 
So uh, some key elements of that sentence, people are important. Uh, you cannot really change people from the outside, right? Uh, so it's not about having a tick box exercise, yeah? Do those 100 people and then that, that's, that's not how it works. Um, but that's implicit in the Cambridge approach, not in that sentence. But you can change people from the inside, yeah? Um, if you see that someone else in the chemistry department started a company, it's very successful, then you think, hmm, maybe I should do that again. I have an idea as well, right? So you can change from the inside. So you get some external impetus, of course, but then you want uh, to do that as well. Um, and it's important to be enabling instead of being prescriptive. Yeah. So don't kill innovation, but enable. Let people do what's good, guide them a little bit, support, uh, but enable instead of being prescriptive. Yeah? I think that's how I would describe the uh, Cambridge approach in that area. Um, there's very different types of money. Uh, that's what I learned over the years. And uh, that works differently in very different countries. Uh, in the UK, you have quite a lot of uh, venture capital or private uh, capital. And so basically money is important uh, to be active, right? Needs to kick you in the ass at the right time and into the right direction. Okay, and state money often is the opposite. Uh, and in some countries, uh, you have quite a lot of state funded money. Yeah? Uh, so support for startups, but that's not the right money yeah? because it doesn't think and act in the right way. Um, and that <coughs> uh, and that actually uh, unfortunately leads to companies that don't really grow. And there's also external factors that can influence that. Uh, lack of investor money, for example, but what's the problem with that? Um, l most of the growth money, virtually everything in my perception really comes from the US. Yeah, uh, That means the value goes there as well, right? And that, uh, that's, I think, what Europe as a whole uh, probably should change in the future. And some countries did that already. France, for example, right? Uh, they fund growth money uh, very differently uh, from how it used to be years ago. And there's one analysis by uh, Hannes Rote, who looked at uh, the startup environment in Berlin and Cambridgeshire. And what you see here is over the years, uh, the number of companies started. Uh, the bigger the circle, the more companies. And the first row is Berlin. Uh, the second one is Cambridgeshire. Uh, the third one is other uh, cities in Germany. And you see in Berlin, you have quite big circles, so to speak, right? Uh, so you have enough companies, even compared to Cambridgeshire, looks roughly uh, in the same order of magnitude, a bit smaller. Um, but what you see already is uh, you have much fewer people working in those companies. Uh, so you have more orange and red and no uh, turquoise or so, right, uh, in the top. Yeah? So you get many companies, but they're much smaller. That's the first conclusion. And the other problem, uh, and that's a very big problem, is uh, they don't grow and they don't achieve, uh, attract any capital either. Okay. Uh, so here you see uh, it's different color coding. Um, you see at the uh, at the circle size here is the amount of funding attracted. And you see the circles at the top, they are by far much, much, much smaller, right? Um, so basically this is uh, if you try to stimulate innovation uh, via state money, and sometimes that's the only option in some sense, right? But that cannot be uh, the only thing you do. Um, then actually you don't uh, achieve growth phases, right? Because you don't have thinking active money basically in your company. So m my learning is if you want to start a company, see where you want to get your money from. Yeah, It should be someone who understands your idea, uh, who engages with you yeah, and who kicks you in the ass uh, at the right time and into the right direction as well. Um, a tech transfer, that also looks very different. So here's an analysis uh, comparing Cambridge Enterprise and the universities in Berlin. It's from the same report. Um, and so that's the experience of people in industry and startups on the x-axis uh, and experience in tech transfer. And you see that the people who work in Cambridge, they have much more experience working in industry and startups um, compared to Berlin universities. There's many people actually working in tech transfer, more people in Berlin than Cambridge, yeah, but they don't have the experience of starting a company. Uh, it's the same uh, if you talk to a VC as well, right, and someone who's a funder, yeah, that's a very different conversation you will have. And that's, I think, something that uh, some that needs to change uh, in Berlin as well in the future. Um, so my current, and it's a naive view uh, on the occlusion Romanian landscape, because I just moved to the place, okay, but it's just a, it's my perception really as an outsider. Yeah? Feel free to give me feedback uh, in the future, no problem. With that. There's an excellent motivation of many uh, graduates, many people here, um, yeah. There's good technical education as well in many areas. Uh, computer science, for example, I think it's very good to recruit in that area here. There's an innovation mindset, um, but there's still some uh, well, old school thinking, well, from the, the devils of the past, if you wish, right? And uh, many, many countries have that. Germany as well, for example. It's a bit stuck in the 80s in many cases, yeah? Uh, so th that is still uh, here. So there's still some uh, change probably needed in that context. 
um, can be in the academic context uh, because it's a very different if you grow into academia you grow up very differently yeah? it's meant to be a secure job and so on yeah it's not innovation means something very different in academia compared to companies um, funding and advisors are sometimes missing but if it's not there just go outside and then call someone in the US right make the connections bring that expertise in um, and very happy to uh, connect you with people there as well just get in touch if you want um, there's a great asset and that's maybe an asset that uh, some people here don't realize um, if you're allowed to do things from scratch so I worked on big pharma companies and they have legacy systems in place that are so old if you need to maintain those it's a pain India did never have landlines landline phones yeah they had 20 million or so of them yeah but it's nothing in such a big country but everyone jumped on mobile phones okay why is that so uh, pickup was much faster than other countries that had landline phones yeah because you had legacy systems in place yeah and legacy systems can hold you back yeah so basically it's an asset if you're able to do things from scratch in this country yeah i see that as quite a privilege yeah? if nothing exists that's great you can build it okay and that's uh, be aware of that asset as well my main advice uh, was to talking to some people here and companies be bolder yeah uh, think big reach out to the us yeah what's the big story you want to tell um, sometimes it's uh, very stepwise from what I encountered, yeah? and maybe that's because I talked to too many VC companies recently. Yeah? But what's the big vision? Uh, you are who you want to be. Okay, you are not only who you are; you are who you want to be. Okay, and that's maybe the uh, story to tell in many cases. Um, so, what are the current plans in Cluj? Uh, talking to UBB and UMF uh, to set up a bioinformatics computer science drug discovery interface. Um, also to see is there a way to actually make use of the local ecosystem uh, to translate that into practice. Um, a, a working title could be AI and Drug Discovery Institute for example. If you're interested in the area uh, then please uh, just do get in touch uh, so the email address is given here. Um, so what are some key learnings? So AI and Drug Discovery has received ample funding but very few clinical compounds needs to deliver. So there's always the question which data, which question, how do I address it to really achieve impact? Uh, there are many opportunities to analyze life science data, go where the impact is, often clinical data, right, biomarkers and so on. Uh, and the environment matters immensely for startup companies. Yeah, the ingredients make the dish, uh, so you need to see who are the founders, staff, where does the money come from, legal exp expertise, experience and so on. So functional ecosystems have many dimensions. If it's not there right now, just reach out, right? Uh, the world is small, so you can bring it in if you need to. Okay, yeah, thanks for listening. one question for you um, what challenges you have like coming from Cambridge and trying to translate here in Romania so how what kind of you know and how we can help you maybe you have challenges and maybe you see you know but for somebody like you somebody like you came from abroad and they wants to enter in bed here you know so what and yeah advice is I think most of the challenges still are still in the future, to be honest. Yeah. So right now it's more aspirational. Okay. So I, I met many good people, and I also met many people who warned me that things here are not so easy. Yeah. And I believe that. But what I'm usually looking for is more the potential. Yeah. Uh, what can you build and so on. Um, I'm very happy to have conversations with all of you about that. Be free to give me input. Most of my challenges probably still come in the future because that is more aspirational at this point in time. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, moving forward, I would like to uh, invite uh, Professor Neagoe uh, here to uh, give uh, her presentation. Uh, Professor Neagoe is from the uh, Medical and Pharmacy uh, University here in, uh, in Cluj. Professor, please join me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Cluj Innovation Days, Andre and the, uh, Stelian and the whole team for this great opportunity. I'm not so happy to speak after Andreas. Um, you imagine, try to be in my place. It's quite difficult. But um, 
my presentation because I am not an AI person for sure. I we try to to steal and to learn from Andreas as much as possible in the field of uh, genomics because um, we try to develop uh, a common project in the field of, of genomics and uh, drug discovery. But what I want to show you a little bit, because maybe many of you, you are not in the field of genomics in healthcare and especially in cancer, and the idea is to see how we can deal with this genomic data. Genomic data uh, means first everything that is related to the genome, of course. The genome of a person, of an organism, means everything related to DNA, RNA, dark matter, um, so all this genetic information that actually pass from genetic to genomics, because we are not looking only to some mutation, some modification in our genome, like Andrea said, that uh, is going to get us uh, older or with uh, less uh, T cells produced by the thymus, but also it's um, how the diseases uh, develop in the human organism. So, very briefly, everything that is related to genome needs AI support. Why? Because consider that you are a clinician, yes? You are in the clinic, I am in the genomic lab. I'm doing, I'm sequencing the genome of a patient. This means more or less 30,000 genes, and if I'm going to do the whole, whole genome or the whole exome, I will generate 200,000 lines that I will print. Yes, because this is my job. I come to you carrying after me some papers with 200,000 lines and give it to you as clinician and asking you, please, this is the genome of your patient. Please decide what kind of treatment he can have. What are you going to do with me? Don't kill me. Just throw me out on the door, yeah? So people like Andreas, knows what to do with this data. We can tell that, look, we need to look to gender, to sex. We need to look to age. We need to look to everything that is germline, so hereditary mutation. We need to look to what was acquired as uh, modification in the genome due to the environment, smoking, um, and so. But the analysis needs to be done in computational genomics, yes? So I will not push this slide too much. Just wanted to show you that actually we can use this genomic data almost in everything it's now. And for example, I don't know how to use this. Okay, doesn't matter. The last line, which is genomic editing. I'm sure that all of you know the Nobel Prize that was offered for the technology of cutting pieces from the gene and replace them with good genes, normal genes, the CRISPR technology, yes? So to find the exact place, the exact guide RNA that we need to use for a specific mutation or for a specific exon or for, for a specific gene, we need computational uh, science to show us where in the genome I have to cut that place. Okay, one of the major transformation in medicine, it's not only related to fundamental and translational science, it's related to the way big pharma will change their way to understand clinical trials. What clinical trials means, everybody know, there are those studies that can be of many types where we are looking uh, to select a specific drug that can give a better response to a treatment for a patient, or they can be observational uh, clinical trials where we look why the eating mango for 20 years uh, makes you look younger and prettier. Yes, so there are different ways. But even here, we have some major things that need to be changed. Because considering my list of 200,000 lines for one patient, if we are going to have 10 patients, this means a good number, yes? But it's not enough because each patient, especially in cancer, autoimmune diseases, cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, obesity, have different 
pathological genome. Yes, and they report their genome to their own healthy genome. So this means that what I need, I need to collect as many samples as possible and not all of them from Cluj. Sure, Cluj is the center of the universe, but maybe I need also from Berlin or from Cambridge or from Asia or from China or from North Africa. Why? Because I need to see differences between their genomes and how to interpret this and how to analyze. A short example is breast cancer, the so-called breast cancer triple negative, which is a very bad cancer for women because it doesn't have any kind of treatment. It doesn't respond to any kind of treatment. And if the Caucasian population develop 10 to 15% of triple negative breast cancer, the, um, African ladies, women, the black African ladies, they develop twice, 30%. So we have to know why they have more triple negative breast cancer than the Caucasian uh, people. So the idea is that these clinical trials, uh, of course, will remain some of them in the area of the drug discovery with big pharma companies. They will not allow, I think, or they will develop a part, a different way uh, of understanding clinical trials, but for drug discovery, for sure, they will keep this uh, in their arms. But on the other side, please check here that the fact that actually the more people or more patients with a certain disease or a certain genome we are able to have the information about, we will be able to create this algorithm of machine learning, what everybody knows that it's done now in imaging in hospitals, yes? Where we collect 5,000 or 50,000 echographies and we do the analysis and we pick one patient, we give it to the algorithm and the, the algorithm is giving us some information. In genomics, consider it's not one image. There are at least 30,000 genes to be analyzed. So the way we recruit for this kind of clinical trial patients, how we identify biomarkers, what a biomarker means, what kind of biomarker. We, are, we, we try to look to biomarker for diagnostic, but this is very, very difficult. So we try to keep in biomarker for response to treatment or uh, prediction. So also how to, ha to optimize the, the design of the trial, which are the adverse reaction of a certain drug, okay? Because one drug can go excellent for 20 patients and very, very bad for 200. So real-time monitoring, what does it mean? That we don't have time to look, we can do this also, but now when we need new drugs, like for breast cancer, triple negative, pancreatic cancer, that you know it's one of the deadliest cancers, uh, gastric cancer, melanoma, um, we don't have this time. So we need the data in real time. So the idea is that from this very centralized in my arms um, clinical trials, we have to go to real world data. For example, maybe some of you know Ikevia, which, is op which operates in Romania and develops real world clinical uh, trials, which I think it's the future and here the AI is the best where it can help patients with many diseases. Um, among this process of uh, decentralization, the biobanks and the cohort studies are very important. Why? You know that one of the major issue in medicine is what I am going to do with your data. Yes? How, if your name, the name of the patient, the age, the address, everything, it's in a database, this will be a big issue. But if we have the possibility to, to have access to this kind of database from biobanks, like is the UK biobank, which is the best, considered the best in the world, where they have anonymized all the data, the personal data of the patients, but they give access to scientists and clinicians, this will change completely 
the way we understand each disease. Again, especially cancer, which remains one of the major threats in the world. So, um, it's nothing new under the sun because we speak about these decentralized clinical trials for more or less 20 years. And you can see um, as years go by that there are more and more decentralized clinical trials. And this will continue and, imp and improve a lot. Uh, we were also involved together with Ikevia in such uh, clinical trial regarding the ovarian cancer. And if, if you consider that we in Cluj, we can deal with maybe 300 cases of ovarian cancer for a period of five years, all the data together um, collected 15,000 of ovarian cancer files, which is huge. So the information that the AI can deal with, can uh, use, can learn is much more important because you can evaluate 15,000 of genomes uh, modified for patients that are developing uh, ovarian cancer, which is one of the worst uh, cancer for women. And here, uh, it's a scheme. It was not updated because I was not able to find something new, but you can see that it grow and it will grow for sure exponentially. Now, uh, going a little deeper in, in the AI, um, last year, NVIDIA uh, sh showed that they were able uh, to put something in Guinness World Record for the fastest DNA sequencing, five hours. We are doing a sequencing and not a whole genome or a whole exome. We are doing the, the sequencing like in one week, maybe seven days, not five hours. What does it mean? That to do this and to do the analysis of the data, you are not coming in the University of Medicine and Pharmacy to the genomic center with the sample because we are going to work on the usual pipeline approved by the company. But we can do the analysis, I mean the wet lab, but when it comes to the, the analysis of the data, you have to choose what you need because it's impossible with the technology that we have now to obtain like a picture, a whole picture of that patient and consider that we will need to do this sequencing for many patients with the same molecular subtype, okay? And you can see why we need brilliant people like Andreas because as many uh, patients we, we sequence, you see the number of zeros considering the files that we have to put together. We had a very simple experiment uh, on cell culture, where we try to show that some drugs can work in, in lung cancer. And we use, actually we selected eight genomes to be uh, sequenced. The, the analysis of these eight samples, it's so complicated. So actually we asked uh, some private company in Italy initially to transform the files in something that we were able to, to, to analyze, to understand. So from the very beginning, the support of doing this kind of analysis, it's mandatory, it's very important. Okay, and again, related to this, because I wanted to show you that the, the, the support for um, bioinformatics and AI, is very important. Of course, here, the five hours, it's a collaboration between Stanford and uh, Oxford Nanopore. Oxford Nanopore, of course, I'm sure you don't know what uh, it's about. Considering that Illumina, Illumina is something like, I don't know, half of this desk. This is the machine that we are using for sequencing. The Oxford Nanopore, the la light, latest technology is something like that. That actually they are so clever, they, made it to be th that you can charge it in your phone or in your car. Yes? Okay, my 15 minutes. I speak too much always, I, I apologize. Okay, so this is the image of the UK Biobank that actually give access to 
everybody who is a specialist in the field to more th than 500,000 samples from British people, which is excellent. And very briefly, some of the ways we can use this genomics uh, AI. And you can see here what we call uh, the analysis of the image, and this is the way we can identify genetic disorders, yes, by doing this deconvolution and, and network. Another way is in cancer, where we can use when we, we don't have enough material, because consider that not all the patients can give you a tumor biopsy or enough tissue to do the analysis. So we need to find something that is minimal invasive. Th this is the future. But being able to, to make the separation between a, a healthy subject and the cancer pa uh, patient. So we can use this for tumor-derived circulating free DNA, as you can see here in the pink image. And using machine learning, these algorithms are able to uh, separate cancer and identify also not uh, patients with only patients with cancer, but also what is the tumor of origin, which is very important. Because considering that the tissue of origin, you will know initially what kind of treatment and the evolution of the cancer. Okay, this is about tumor heterogeneity, but Mircha will kill me. So um, the idea, here, for example, the analysis in Revolver, which was a clinical trial based on, uh, on trunks, uh, initially they have done the analysis of 99 non-small cell lung cancer, yes? And they were able to uh, derive a decision tree classifier that stratifies 589 tumors. You will say, okay, so no big deal from 99 to 600, what's this? That's huge. It's it's beautiful for medicine because you will know how a, sp a specific genome of a patient will answer to a specific treatment. Okay, thank you. Hello everyone, let's see the slides if we have them. By the way, I failed my AI exam when I was in university from graduating computer science. <laughs> I mean the first time when I had this exam. Uh, luckily I learned uh, 15 years later more about AI from the online courses. <laughs> so uh, even if I graduated computer science, uh, I got quite enthusiastic about what's happening besides what we can do with IT itself and uh, my programmer life was quite short lived because I went to a startup weekend in, and then at some point it happened that uh, the team that I was in, I was in won the event and then we got funding, we got, got office, we got uh, a lot of support and uh, launched me on another trajectory, the entrepreneurial one. So I've been involved along the years in uh, many things, many industries uh, from the startup perspective, uh, still active with them, trying to be active. Uh, sometimes things are overwhelming. And um, today I'm going to present uh, a couple of things about what we see in the health tech ecosystem and then uh, some challenges. We had the report which we launched uh, in February. It was the third time. It's a report uh, monitoring the health tech startups in Romania with a couple of the sponsors there. And the map looked like this. We had to select around uh, 70, 80 startups because uh, on the map we had uh, a little bit more than 200. And I think there are many more initiatives which uh, actually do not qualify as uh, startups because they come from different backgrounds or they're not serious enough or they have different structures. But looking at just at the startup ecosystem, we saw this map. It's quite hopeful because five years ago when I, or seven years ago when I dived into, started diving into health tech, there were uh, very few startups and very few organizations involved into this. And now, uh, seven years later, it feels to me that is the, 
the most uh, inspiring, most impactful uh, startup domain that we see in Romania. And uh, of course, uh, with effects on our lives as well, we hope in the future. And even uh, just uh, a couple of months ago, one of our colleagues uh, broke her leg at ski and uh, she started using a device called Reflex, uh, which is a startup that was created in 2015. I was uh, working with a uh, founder back then. He had a different startup and then he realized it can have use in, med in uh, health tech. So it was amazing to see the journey and the development of his startup as well, but also of the ecosystem. So we have tools for institutions, we have telemedicine tools, we have tools for concerned individuals, patients and families, and for healthcare professionals. The spectrum is quite uh, wide. Uh, this is just a selection of the most, the startups that we think they deserve to be there. Of course, this needs update every year because there are new startups, new fundraising uh, done and so on. As well, we have many founders, Romanians, who are living abroad and uh, they created health tech uh, companies, startups, and they got 10 times more funding than our Romanian startups got uh, just because they were in a much more agile, much more better financed uh, uh, countries. Like uh, we see UK, uh, we see Germany, we see uh, US and Canada, for example, and probably there are several other more. So our data is based on the graphics are based on the public data that we managed to obtain. Probably there are some underground things as well, not published. Um, and we managed to do all this with the help of uh, EIT Health, which is uh, one of the organizations having impact in Europe and supported by the EU Commission through funding and various programs uh, all over Europe. Uh, for example, the Jumpstarter program that uh, uh, we ran with two cohorts uh, here in uh, Romania, but there are like 20 more all over Europe, like people who are uh, having a startup idea all, all across industries. We take care of uh, healthcare in uh, Romania. Then Digitpre, which is another acceleration program with, uh, with 10 partners in seven countries with the aim to support uh, innovative solutions in prevention, prediction, and remote care. So there are many, many programs that people can access in uh, Romania. As well, we launched uh, Hubvantage, which is a membership club for uh, health tech founders to connect them with uh, uh, medical doctors and with health tech uh, investors, and as well to help each other, help them uh, communicate better with each other. There's a lot of knowledge in founders' head, which is not shared because it's not facilitated is not shared among themselves because they can learn from each other quite a lot. And we try to create events in which people are put together and they can share their experience, contacts, knowledge, uh, anything that could be useful to others. So now getting back to my last part of the presentation, oftentimes it feels like uh, innovation is uh, welcome this way uh, with this thing that we have uh, online. I think Ion found it some time ago. Uh, because we're too busy in our way of doing things, in our systems, in our jobs on a daily basis, that uh, oftentimes we just mentally become so much focused in doing what we need to do that we forget that we can. there is a better way to do it. And our brains and ourselves and our teams as well, they get somehow used to do things in such a way that when something new comes, it's oftentimes rejected. And it happens to me almost on a weekly basis, and I try to sw switch my mindset because I want to have a better life in the end with the help of ChatGPT, although it's more comfortable to write my text <laughs> than pass it to ChatGPT. Uh, and along the ways, uh, now I'm also crossing through a darker period of my life, and uh, I started looking at things that don't work per se, and it feels like I should be putting things uh, up front from time to time in context and helping. Because the panel in the morning was very positive and I think we have a lot of positive things in the Romanian ecosystem in Cluj as well. Uh, from some perspective, it might be the center, uh, at least of Romania. Uh, but at the same time, we have some challenges. And if we don't look at these challenges, uh, I don't think we're gonna go next level. So oftentimes I saw us, and our organizations and the ecosystem in Romania itself and Eastern Europe because it's a general trait, focusing uh, on the rigid structures and titles and processes. And this oftentimes means that we look in one way and we cannot accept innovation, as I said earlier, if we reject it. And uh, I was 
it's frequent to see something in U.S. I've been on a trip to the Research Triangle in North Carolina just a month ago with the Ministry of Research delegation, and then in Boulder, Colorado, and there was a round table with 30 people there, and there was the vice dean of the university there, and there was a student which was 20 years old, had a startup, and they were addressing each other by name, like uh, Mircea Andrei, Iwana, uh, Lavinia and so on. And I was shocked to see that this kind of conversation, very flexible, was happening on a, such a high level. And it felt like people were behind structures, they were, uh, uh, besides titles, they were just communicating with each other as human beings. And I think this is a step that we should do as well. We have a strong legacy here in Eastern Europe about being very strict, very formal. And if we manage to let this go, at least in our bubble here in Cluj, uh, in time, things will get uh, much, much better, and we can be an example in this sense. Um, oftentimes, and I, I talk about myself in these things, but I also project them on others. It's about, uh, I haven't found a better word, asumare, uh, like uh, carrying the flag, because oftentimes this means that if you try to change something, you become a target for the people who are engaged in the specific process system or whatever you want to change, and this means conflict. and. Uh, now I am a believer that conflict should be put on the table with the aim to sort it out because it's not a bad thing and we should step out when we see something that even if it can generate a conflict, we talk about it, we don't need to solve it, but at least we put it on the table and we see it and it's not driving us from behind. Because, um, yeah, I don't think we have enough empathy and understanding of each other. It's not about our roles in the society and organizations. I think it's more about we as human beings. If I empathize with each one of you, I cannot be much uh, or often in a conflict with you because then I understand your position and there is a dialogue. And I've been witnessing in the past several years a conflict between two major organizations in Romania uh, being conflictual, but the leaders are not talking with each other at all. So they just read what the others says in various press releases and articles, and they don't sit at the same table in order to discuss their conflict and see if that can be sorted out, at least to be having it there uh, on the table. So even that would be a good, st uh, a good step forward. And then, yeah, uh, I think the same Eastern European scarcity perspective, we still carry it to some extent, and probably the foreigners have seen it quite often. We think from a scarcity perspective, and this means less sharing with each other, less uh, sharing of, of information or applications together or creating things together because we, we are somehow aiming somehow to be in a better position than the others. And this is scarcity mindset. And then my belief, at least on the theoretical level, because I also fall in that trap, is that uh, there is plenty of things for uh, everyone if we grow together. And then, uh, yeah, I see the numbering is changing there for some reason. <laughs> what I often said, uh, saw, and uh, I actually deducted a little bit later and was one of the topics I had with Andre this morning, that people come with a forward agenda, but then they don't declare the full uh, agenda there in the, and they keep it for themselves, and then you see that things turn out in a different direction. And what I would love to see in the ecosystem, that interests are put on the table. Interests are legit. Uh, I know that in Romanian interest has a bad meaning, but if I have the interest for something to happen and if I share it, people will know it and sometimes they can act on it and sometimes not. Uh, but it doesn't have this, uh, I shouldn't have this bad meaning. Each one of us has an interest for something to happen in a specific personal or professional situation. So if I know that, I can work with that because I want to respect people's interests. I want uh, my interest to be respected and find the middle ground in this perspective. And oftentimes I also saw this, uh, we declare that, uh, yeah, we want to join and we do things, uh, but at the same time we start really acting uh, when there's money on the table. What I've saw in the past with teacher organizations that I started, at first there were no money on the table, uh, except one, when it was like six months to one year volunteering in the hopes that something will come up, and in the end it came up. Some other six uh, that died, nothing came up funding, so in the end we decided to close them. Yeah, so I think innovation doesn't start from the technology. Now I started to create a new vision on that. I think innovation starts with uh, uh, ourselves in terms of mindset, and we have a lack of self-awareness. Every time when a founder calls me or drops me a message, hey, I want to talk, I say, 
oh, fuck, one more uh, call or email that I need to deal with. That is a mindset that I need to work my, uh, myself and as well, probably you as well, uh, on some other things. So it's, if I have this self-awareness to see where I'm not innovative myself as a person, then I think this will bubble up uh, and will affect technology and the way we think technology and we do technology and the way we innovate. Thank you very much. Um, otherwise, I just want to share that I think we're in a brilliant spot here in Cluj. I think we just need to leverage on a couple of things that are drawing us back in order to make it work on a much, much better level. Thank you. Okay, please. Uh, no, no. Actually, everything we are doing, it, uh, it's at the level of uh, the analysis of the data, the big data. From, uh, uh, from the genome of our patients using specific software and uh, type of analysis, but we are not yet in the field of AI. Any other question? Questions? Yeah, please. There are two different things. At this moment, we are not a part of the UK Biobank. First, because uh, administrative, we are from European uh, Union, and they are not anymore. Um, but we have our own biobank. Uh, we have we can collect samples from different clinics, not only in Cluj, which is very important because. What we found in a study looking for the breast cancer, where there are two hereditary genes, BRCA1 and 2, everybody knows about Angelina Jolie, we found that this, the mutation in the population in Transylvania, in women with breast cancer, this kind of breast cancer, are similar with uh, people, with uh, ladies from Poland, not from Hungary, not from Bulgaria, from Poland. Um, so we try to collect samples from dif different hospitals. We collaborate very well with uh, hospitals in Bucharest, in Timisoara, and in Iași. So, and also we have a common European grant with the people in Bulgaria and Plovdiv. So we try to collect, uh, but we do not have the capacity to collect thousands of samples. We collect samples according to the requirement of the study. Uh, what I what we have now, yes, yes. But again, one major thing that happened in genomics is the fact that now we are not able only to collect fresh samples as it was a few years ago. We can use the paraffin embedded sample. And remember that each hospital that has um, a pathology department it's mandatory to keep the paraffin blocks for 30 years in Romania. So this is a very good law because you can look, you can do the analysis, and you can have all the data of a certain patient that went and was in surgery, the survival, uh, so many clinical data. You, you don't have data for the treatment, let's say what happened because it was not possible, but at least you can have many data that you can compare with what is happening w with new patients that are enrolled in a study. Uh, this is brilliant. Uh, there are many U.S. companies that are looking for buying uh, this kind of material, which is not allowed, at least for now. Okay. You know, uh, 
we spend a lot of time to change the mindsets of people to be more entrepreneurial, thinking out of the box. Uh, but we have also see a lot of differences uh, in different populations, let's say in Germany or Japan or Romania, a lot of differences that are coming from uh, uh, the environment, the external environment. And my, I have a curiosity if uh, genomics is capable also, and if it is possible, of course, to see how uh, over the life of a person could be some mutations there just because of this external environment as if we can collect information from genomics after that to make a kind of personalized kind of coaching to this person. It's a little bit out of the box things, but yeah, I'm just curious to see. Yeah. Um, I think I can answer in many ways. What I can tell you is that one of our grant leader who is coming from Netherlands, uh, he's uh, Romanian of origin. He took some samples from the um, History Museum and analyzed the genome of 2,000 years old humans and compared with the, the, our genome, let's say. And he saw the modification and they are the, their study is trying to show how much the environment is uh, involved in the way our genome uh, is modified during the years. But also what we see in our current studies is, for example, in lung cancer. Um, I can give you a very simple uh, example and uh, ask you. Half, 50 percent of, of lung cancers appear in people that are smoking, hardly. 50 percent are appearing in patients that never smoke. Why? <laughs> and a certain genome, a certain phenotype, a certain um, instability, genomic instability, a certain relationship with the immune system. For example, we look to pneumonia and lung cancer, nothing together between these two diseases, yes? Do you think it's something? No. What we know is that uh, patients that develop a lung cancer, they can develop pneumonia because of the immune system which is very much depressed. But on the other side, there are some studies showing that uh, patients that have many pneumonia that was not diagnosed and treated are at a higher risk to develop uh, lung cancer. Yes, yes, so it's a lot of correlation with the environment. Of course, which means somatic mutation, but also it's very important your hereditary background. Maybe Andreas here can answer much better than me. <laughs> okay, so uh, we'll take one more question, then uh, uh, I will ask uh, each one of you the same question, and uh, I think that uh, after that we can close up the discussion. So, please. Sure. Don't huh. eat uh, nice, sweet tomatoes from the market in the center, those that have that you know, hard form. Don't buy them. They contain they contain a specific toxic substance that is forbidden in Europe. It's full on the market. Yeah, some high vitazo. I adore those tomatoes. <laughs> they are excellent. That's why. Probably, <laughs> because of that chemical, so. <laughs> and, yes, and they copy, you know, the form of the tomatoes that you can grow in your garden or that come from Oldenia, mm. as we know. Yeah, we call them with tzutza. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so um, I have uh, one question. Uh, I would like to kick off with one question. Uh, so uh, I would like you to share your uh, your view on the current status of the health eco ecosystem here in Romania. And I would like to start off with uh, Andreas, uh, who has an uh, outsider's pers perspective. Then uh, continue to the rest of you. So. Yeah. 
<coughs> I cannot give you any full insight because most of you will know better. But I can tell you what matters, and that is building networks. Yeah, that is always important to me. Transfers between academia and companies, for example, right? Building network networks. You cannot make anything happen by yourself usually, right? But that's what matters. Yeah, it, it, the whole that relates to what you said. The whole is greater than the sum of the parts, right? If you do something together, the pie grows. The scarcity mindset, yeah, and it's the opposite in my perception, yeah. And I think uh, th that mindset really helps, yeah. So it's more aspirational and all that. But that is, uh, I think, what matters if you want to build something, yeah, if that you go into something with that mindset, yeah. Um, I can give you a more medical example. I'm not sure I'm good to, to answer directly. What is happening in oncology, for example, in the last years? Each clinic has its own tumor board for each type of cancer. What tumor board means? That there you have a team. You have the surgeon, you have the pathologist, you have the chemotherapist, you have the radiologist, you have the geneticist. So all of them, they discuss, they understand the case, and they propose the best uh, and the newest uh, treatment possible for uh, each patient, which I think is the same that has to happen in this field. I think we are not uh, specifically into the clinic. We are not yet there. We are not yet. But of course, this will be the future. You know that the law in Romania yesterday or the day before the law of the personalized medicine was finally approved. Now they are doing, I don't know, the set of criteria and so on. But it's very important because this will mean the necessity of the IT person. Yeah, yeah. It's a loss on translation because they don't collaborate, communicate. Also, you put the data there, they do it, but then you have to put all these people at the same table. Yes, but and you have also the IT people, exactly, the AI yeah. people needs to explain what about. Yeah, and then also you have the politician to give the, and then yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Andrei, what's your current view on the health tech ecosystem at the moment? Um, I'm not the expert. Um, I have to say this uh, very, very clearly, but uh, uh, we are enablers. Uh, we are enablers of a dialogue that uh, we all agree that needs to happen between all these stakeholders uh, in order to have that kind of uh, medicine that uh, indeed um, comes to the aid of, of human beings. Uh, and um, we are working towards that. Um, and. I can only agree with what uh, Mircea was saying uh, before, that um, we need to have a strategic um, alignment between all these stakeholders in order to see that things are moving ahead. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's very difficult. And I want to say that, uh, you know, coming in contact with uh, these European partners that we have now in the uh, health tech sector, uh, I realize that uh, what we are facing here is not specific to Romania necessarily. It's specific to uh, other ecosystems as well. So they they face the same challenges. They are maybe uh, more advanced in, in some areas, but uh, the challenges are the same. It's the lack of uh, dialogue between the stakeholders. It's a lack of understanding or having a common language uh, between all these uh, um, um, organizations. And um, sometimes it's, it can be even personal, as uh, Mitya said. Uh, so there is a lot of ego involved uh, in, um, in, um, uh, in the sector. So um, these are all things that are happening uh, elsewhere as well. Um, what I see on the positive side, uh, though, uh, that is happening uh, elsewhere and less in Romania, is that um, they acknowledge. They acknowledge the problems much more uh, openly that, that we do. And uh, that's something that we can all should work, we can and we, sh we should all work on. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I believe uh, each one of us has uh, some type of uh, thing, ego, that we need to satisfy from a specific angle and that again is perfectly fine, perfectly humane. And that's one of the issues, but it's not the biggest one per se. Um, I think we're in a good place. I think we have a lot of opportunities, like from the research side, from the 
uh, funding side, from the startup side, uh, from the uh, administration side. I think, we, as Andre said, if we sit at the table and we communicate more often, I think we can overcome many challenges and just uh, go forward using the chances we have. Um, yeah, I'm pretty hopeful about that. Uh, we have the milestones that we need to go, each one of us to some extent, as mindset and as well as uh, doing things forward. So I hope that five years from now on things will be quite uh, good on the healthcare area. I don't think it's just about the medical part, it's also about the prevention part, which uh, is uh, loading the whole system because we don't have a good prevention in Romania or public health uh, process. And so, so there are many things to do. It's motivating and I think people, if they find a good environment and a good community here, people will start building and uh, yeah, come towards us to, to do products or so. Or we might do products because in the end we see a lot of problems that we could choose to solve at some point. Yeah, thank you. And I only hope, uh, and with this I will uh, otherwise conclude, I, I, will on I only hope that at some point we will see a presentation from Andreas where we will see uh, Cluj and Romania uh, on, on that chart and uh, compared to Cambridge. And even if we are not right there, at least compared to Cambridge. I think that, that's a good, that's a good uh, let's say, uh, uh, objective. So thank you guys for uh, for your contribution, your interesting presentations. Uh, I would like you to give a round of applause from everyone. And looking forward to to meet and discuss. Uh